Hello there. Sorry from 17 once again. This is my Sekiro Shadows Die Twice video walkthrough. This is going to be a slightly larger format or video than you might be used to with my walkthroughs, and it's going to be covering the first uh, full-blown section of the game. We're starting out in the well at the beginning, and this is going to be a standard new game, and the walkthrough's intention is to help new players tackle this game uh, from start to finish, hopefully showing some strategies and some philosophies that might help you get some success. The first thing you'll notice is I'm playing as Genichiro, not Wolf. It's just a simple mod on PC that swaps the model. It gives me no added advantage, no added benefit, it changes absolutely nothing except for the cosmetic. And at this beginning here, you can follow the tutorial if you want to, or you can feel free to jump past it all and uh, get to the cutscene trigger that's going to give you the weapon that's going to enable you to fight back. And the first thing you will do in this tutorial is get introduced to a stealth mechanic and then fighting the first of the standard swordsmen, which is this particular character here who will go down with a flurry of blows. This one will not. This guy likes to block. If that guy deflects you, he will recover faster than you will, so do not try to mash through it. You will have to deflect his attack afterwards. And then on this doorway, there are two standard guys, followed by two more guys to the left of me. One of them is one of the upgraded ones who will actually give you a bit of a fight. So, there is the first guy, take him down. And then the second guy is the more durable of the two. So, the biggest piece of advice I can give you while playing Sekiro is the importance, of course, of the deflect mechanic. When an enemy attacks you like this fellow is doing right now, if you press block the moment the attack is about to touch your body, you will deflect their move and you will give them posture damage. Once you do enough posture damage, it will open the enemy up to something known as a death blow. The death blow is what's happening right now and it will immediately get rid of the entire altercation. Sekiro is a very rigid game in how it wants you to play it. You are going to have the best time and the most efficient means of fighting things by standing in their face, deflecting everything they do, while chaining a series of R1 attacks into a death blow. That is kind of how the game wants you to interact with almost every circumstance. There are a few things on there to modify, the prosthetics, the skills, things of that nature, some of the items that you can use, but fundamentally, if you deviate from the way that Sekiro wants you to play it, you are going to have a much more difficult more frustrating time. Coming up here is the character that we're actually playing as, Genichiro of Ashina, and this is the tutorial boss. So at the beginning, he will always run at you and do a double swing. Whenever he does that arcing move to the side like that, if there's a perilous symbol pop up, it means that he's going to do a sweep. Because we don't have the Makiri counter at this moment, whenever he does his perilous thrust, I'm going to block it at the last possible instant and then go from there. You don't have to, you can dodge it if you want to, you can move out of the way of it if you want to. But this first battle here is one of those tutorial fights where it gives you the impression that you're supposed to lose it, but you don't have to if you don't want to. One of the things you'll notice very quickly in this encounter is the relationship between vitality and posture. In this game, if you just deflect everything in front of the enemy, chances are, especially if it's a boss, you're not going to death blow them too soon. You have to use a combination of being aggressive, hitting them, and then of course, deflecting what they do. One of the ways to counteract this design choice is to do damage to the boss. Every time you hit the enemy, you will lower their vitality, and the lower their vitality, the slower their regen of their posture will be. The move that he did just then, when he does two swings and then turns around, will always end in that particular hit string. So if you learn the hits, you can indeed counter it as I did. And be careful in the second phase here, guys, because when he does his jump in the air, he can now mix up between using the thrust for Makiri or using a sweep. So you have to read what he does, react to it, and then counter attack as, for some reason, they give the same symbol for every one of those perilous attacks. There's not one unique for thrusts, there's not one unique for sweeps or grabs, and it's a shame, actually. Uh, some people have postulated that perhaps a colour coding could have helped, but the way the game is at the moment is literally that. You see that symbol, you read the move, and you react. So, we've now come to the dilapidated shrine. What I'm going to do, guys, for the people who uh, are needing a very specific moment in the walkthrough, I'm going to put timestamps in the description. 
From there, I'm going to be able to help you to jump to the area that you're having trouble with, and then you'll see me beat it, and hopefully you'll take the strategies and win. What I'm not going to be doing too much of on in this particular run is I will not be messing around with the upgrades too much to the specific prosthetics. Uh, what I'm going to do, folks, is I'm going to tell you some of the uses that they have and, some, and show you some of the cool features you can do. But for the most, I'm going to probably only use them as a utility. I'm not going to have any strategies that are too focused on them. But if I know of them, I will describe them to you so you can use them if you want to. When I fight most of the bosses, I'm not going to be using buffs. I'm not going to be using prosthetics. I'm just going to fight them. And if I fight them in this manner, it will enable me to show you some of the things you can do when you don't have any options. And then on top of that, you can introduce your own options to the fight to get extra success. There are so many ways to to do preposterous things to some of the encounters coming up, and I recommend that you do. You know, Sekiro is a very mean game, it's a very fierce game, and if you want to stand a chance, you want to use all the tools in your repertoire. And if that means permanently stunlocking a boss with firecrackers, I say go for it, you know. They exist to be used, From Software knows that they're absolutely broken, and they didn't nerf them which is something I should probably discuss. I'm going to be playing this full thing on version 1.02. The version of the game now is 1.03, and there have been some slight changes to features, but of course I recorded this before the patch existed. Uh, the biggest change that you're going to notice is that they've they've nerfed the counter damage on the Senpu high kicks. There was two moves, the, the first one and then the final one, that did a lot of posture damage if you countered a sweep with them, which is kind of the whole point of the move in my opinion, so the, the patch to me sounds preposterous and I don't agree with it. But it must be said that compared to the jump that I did just then against this fellow, the kick punish gives you a major reward. It gives you the kind of reward I can get behind. and. I probably wouldn't have been so angry with the patch if they'd made the jump attack punish better. Because I look at it like this, folks. When I'm doing a very specific punish to a very specific move that the enemies don't necessarily have to do, and in most cases will not do it, I should be rewarded for seeing that opportunity encountering. I don't understand the concept of completely gimping something because it rewarded a skillful use in that very specific endeavour. And there was a transition just then, guys, because I wanted to show you that down there beneath me was a secret ledge that has access to some sugars if you want to get some of the better sugars earlier on. But I wanted to do the fight coming up, so instead of going that way, which is a shortcut to skip this entire encounter in this entire area, uh, I did the transition to get us back on track, and uh, I'll show you my path through this room now. Because one of the big deviations from previous From titles, if you're familiar with the Soul series, is that Sekiro offers the ability to do a lot of more guerrilla tactics. There's a lot of stealth that you can do in this, an infiltration-based espionage. You can get all in there, listen to people's secrets, and then seek and destroy. And it opens up a lot of opportunities to being very mobile and being very lethal. Because if you can get behind an enemy, it generally doesn't matter how strong they are, you can do a preposterously damaging stab to them, which is what I'm doing here. And this particular environment is full of a whole host of different opponents to take on. The problem with them is a couple of them have guns, some of them uh, might be people you're not too used to, so using a bit of these tactics you can lower their numbers and then take them on at a better, better advantage to you. Get used to the grapple mechanic, get used to the traversal, all of the things that make the game slightly unique compared to what From really does in the past. And then it can lead me to the discussion on, on how I'm going to be treating this particular run. So, I want to fight a decent amount of battles just to give you some strategies if you ever get caught in them. And I want to do it just because it's, you know, the fun of the game is, is the combat for a lot of people. And it's kind of the bread and butter of what this game has going for it. I will never argue that skipping a lot of the fights is probably the best strategy to play. And there are going to be moments where I do exactly that. Where I show you some pretty succinct paths that will get you through with very pretty much relative ease. You don't have to encounter too many people, you can avoid all the tough things, and you can kind of decide on your own merit whether or not you want to take on some some encounters and, and different ways to subvert them if you don't. But this lady here is quite important because she's going to give us a bell. The young lord's bell is going to take us into a memory, and inside that memory we're going to get access to two of my favourite of the prosthetics, the flame vent and the uh, monkey axe. 
those two particular manoeuvres can really open up some interesting avenues of damage as I fight with the game's mantling system here. Which, you might be thinking maybe my uh, depth perception then was slightly off because of the angle. You'd be surprised how vacuumous the grab can be. He certainly just vacuums to ledges sometimes and it doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you come over here with a decent amount of money and some of the coin purses that you might have picked up along the way, if you can get 500 gold or 500 sen, you can buy Robert's firecrackers. And you're not going to see me use the firecrackers much, guys, because the item, in my opinion, is absolutely stupid. This, this tool is so much better than all the other tools, I cannot, in full conscience, tell you to use anything else. Because unless an enemy is immune to it, which is what can sometimes happen, there's almost nothing that compares to the advantage that that tool can give you. And there are literal bosses that cannot move if you use it correctly. There are encounters that can be completely circumvented if you use it correctly. However, there is a skill to using it. The, the item itself has a cooldown, and they have to be at a certain proximity. But fundamentally, if you watch a speedrun of this game, you will be able to see just how ridiculous the firecrackers can be when used correctly. And you don't have to upgrade them, you don't have to get the fancy ones, you can get the very first firecracker and have success for the entirety of the game. And I'm not going to not use them because I feel superior to them or something like that. It's just that they almost entirely circumvent playing the actual game. If you don't want to learn the game, if you just want to beat it for trophies and move on to something that you like, then this is the tool you want to use because it's that good. And the environments that I'm going to use it in, I'm going to use it against the folding screen monkeys because it enables me to chase them down more effectively. I'm going to use it against the bull because I think it's the biggest piece of dog shit in the game. And I'm going to use it, or I'm probably not going to use it, but I'm going to tell you to use it against the third phase of Genichiro, and potentially Genichiro 1 and 2. Because you can stop people from going into big flurries, and you can use it as an opportunity to punish. And one of the really cool things about the firecrackers is that the initial explosion of firecrackers does a decent amount of posture damage, especially to beasts. It does a surprising amount of posture damage, it's really, really useful. But the transition just then was me cutting out some of the shopkeeper. I'm going to be showing you where some of the shopkeepers are and talking to them and things, but fundamentally, I'm probably not going to be doing too much specifically through shops. To my knowledge, the only real thing I'm going to be going for is I want the firecrackers because I need to show you that these things are ridiculous and you should be using them, and I'm also going to want to get the, the fan that you can get from the black hat guy, which we'll be getting slightly later on. And the fan, I think, is one of the most slept-on prosthetics in the game. It's really, really useful. This this little tour, just right now, shows you where the Gatchin Sugar is. I did that so that I didn't have an item that you didn't have, so you know where it is. And we're going to be using it coming up to kill the first life bar on the Ogre. I will continue my fan talk after this, because it's going to be happening very shortly. So the ogre coming up is not a particularly difficult fight, but he has a couple of grabs that have really bad detection. They will grab you when you're nowhere near them. They will do L-shaped bends, all kinds of banana gropings to grab your titties and stiff you into the floor. And it's instant death if you get grabbed at this point outside. I think one of them will throw you behind him. You'll survive that one, but the other ones will kill you. And one strategy that you can use, which is really effective, is you can actually fight him with your back towards the, the cliff of the stairs there. And whenever he goes to grab you, you just jump backwards. He will never grab you because he can't grab you past the edge. And then all you do is you hook onto him and hook back. And I had a really cool fight where I did that to this guy and killed him that way. But when I was recording this, when I jumped backwards and I hooked back towards him, I collided into his face, collided with his massive head, and then fell off the edge because I couldn't actually get back onto the ledge. So it wasn't going to be too viable for the people if it went wrong. So the strategy I wanted to show instead was using Gatchin's sugar to, to get rid of the first life bar and then just moving around him. Whenever he recovers after a physical attack, he has a tendency to go into a grab. Then if you're moving behind him, he generally will miss by just moving out of its way like that. There are times when it will still hit you, so always be careful and always be ready to jump or to dodge depending on which one you have the most success with, but things like that. If he decides to banana that grab, there's no planet where it's not grabbing me, and this is one of the areas where I think that FromSoft just completely fucks up their games, and I'll always think this, and I'll never not think this. You should not get grabbed by something that does not grab you. It should not vacuum you into it, it should not teleport you into it, it should not pivot at the final moment. That's not how it should work. 
The grab can be fast, the grab can be lethal, but make it fair, dude. Don't make it grab me when it's nowhere near me. And that's one of the only areas where I just wish they would change this philosophy because it's not cool. It really isn't, and it can be dealt with, it can be adjusted to, but that doesn't make it any better. It's still bad design. But back to the dilapidated shrine. That right there uh, was me going and uh, talking to the sculptor so that I can get some access to prosthetics. I'm now going to be rocking the loaded shuriken. The loaded shuriken is one of my favourite of the arms because it enables you to buy a skill that will cover great distances very quickly. And I'm a big fan of that because it's good at keeping pressure on enemies. This particular courtyard coming up, not only does it have a, a guy who alerts people, the guy who bangs on the frying pan, but it also has a bunch of people with guns, a bunch of people patrolling, and then there's another one of those mini-bosses that has two HP bars and the Murakumo. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump down here, skip that entire sequence, hit the shrine, and then I'm going to go back for the boss. I don't want to really kill the dudes. The, the dudes can be chain-killed by stabbing them from behind. It's, it's a very uh, iterative path of moving around and killing everybody. But that doesn't interest me because I don't need it. I'm not looking for skill points just yet. I'm not really looking for the, the experience they give or the items they drop. This guy is useful because you're going to be playing this game. It might be your first time. And the more HP you have in this game, the safer you are when it comes to the encounters. And this guy's going to drop a resource that gives you HP. So, he begins by doing his armoured jump, which, that move just then that he did was armoured as well, you need to be careful of that. Uh, this guy has a very fast elbow thrust that leads into his second hit. He also has a sweep that you want to be careful of. But the only real threat that this guy has once you understand what he's doing is when he does his hyper armour moves, you will not interrupt him by attacking. He's doing it now, see that? If I kept attacking, he would attack through what I'm doing and I would be in trouble. But there's his super slow move that I always guard too early. There it was again. Keep the pressure on him. There's his overhead. Keep the, the rally going. There's his overhead. Did you notice how I swung once and then I had to swing again afterwards with my deflect? There's something about his response with the high one. And I'll explain why this is actually a decent habit to get into. If he does the other move where he thrusts his elbow, if you're waiting for the slow one, he'll it'll hit you and stun you and make you flinch every time. However, when he deflects you, if you press deflect afterwards and he doesn't do the elbow, all you've done is done one extra deflect and you look a bit silly. Then you can wait for the strike to come down and deflect it on timing. However, if you just wait to read it, you've got to be really, really sharp. So that's one of the rare instances where I would recommend after doing a deflect, uh, sorry, after he deflects you, pressing deflect just in case the elbow comes, and then you can get the deflect on it, and then you don't lose anything. One thing I have to stress as I duck the snake right here, is that I do not in any way condone or encourage you to spam L1. L1 spamming in this game is incredibly, preposterously, ludicrously stupid. It is so powerful, I don't blame people for doing it. I really don't. I just believe fundamentally that you shouldn't. In my opinion, in a game that's supposed to reward precision and be about parrying, you shouldn't be able to mash parry and get parries. That's not how this should work. It should be punished really, really heavily, and it's not. But in certain instances, I can understand kind of option selecting an, an extra deflect to make sure you cover your bases. And for that, I fully support it. But you will never ever hear me encouraging the mantra of smashing parry rather than timing it. If you learn to time your parries, you will be so much more rewarded in this game and get so much better at it. And then when you play with Kuro's charm and you have that debuff where you get chip damage unless you deflect everything, you're not going to get wrecked. Because the one greatest problem with mashing parry in this game is it gives you delusions of grandeur. You think that you're playing the game, but you're not. You're just playing yourself. So if you go and you pop that buff on, you're going to die because you're not deflecting, you're not timing it correctly. All the timing is the game and you getting lucky. And it's just, it's a really bad habit to get into. And I understand why people do it. 99% of the people that play this game are gonna fucking do it. You know they are, I know they are, but this is just one player to another saying, trust me folks, if you learn to time it, it feels so much more rewarding and it makes the game make sense. And that's coming from somebody who doesn't even really like the parry mechanic in this game. 
and I'm still saying, please, at least try to learn it, you know? The, the joy of this kind of experience is feeling like you've improved, and it's so important. But this room here is completely skippable. It has some spear guys, it has a guy with a gun, it has one of the big dudes that are walking around all depressed, which is an interesting one, and I haven't fought one of those yet, but I'll probably fight one later on just to show you it. They're not that difficult to fight, they're pretty slow, they've got a ton of HP though, you need to be careful of that. And here's the second gun guy just over there, you can throw some shurikens if you want to. I'm deciding against it. You can stealth this entire room if you do the path correctly. But I kind of like a combination of stealth and a combination of combat. It kind of shows the game off. There's going to be an interesting moment in the Hirata estate where I end up fighting like 10 people at the same time. Because I'm looking to make it a little bit more exciting. And then you realise that you're very limited by what you can do. And it's not very exciting at all. <laughs> but here's the standard guy. He likes to deflect. That confused me then. Did you notice how I didn't go for the death blow immediately? Because I thought the guy I was fighting had done a perilous attack. And I've never seen that before. So it confused me. And then I realised that's the spear dude. And the good news is when you go into a death blow, you're invincible. So I used the death blow, that's why I delayed it a little bit. Uh, I was stunned and then I delayed it a little bit so that when you go into it, if he was going to hit us, we would get the invincibility. And then over here you have the guy mourning his poor horse, which I always feel bad for killing that dude. But at this moment in time, every piece of skill is going to help because it's going to put towards buying some abilities coming up. The abilities that I'm going to be going for, I'm going to go for both the carp skills because they're useful. I'm going to go for... Oh, by the way, guys, this is what the firecrackers can do to this boss. So, uh, you can hit him like five times here, throw a firecracker, and then hit him for another three or four times. And then as, as he runs away from you, if he passes you a second time, you can do it again. And you can just repeat it, and it's incredibly strong. But, of course, I, I didn't want to do that because I want to show you the fight, what can happen when not everything goes your way. But at the beginning, always try to get a good 5 hits on him. And the one piece of advice I can give for this guy is a lot of his moves are slower than they look. And then he's got one or two that are faster. That one just then, where he like pivots and then swings from the other side, is immeasurably quick. And the, the second piece of advice here is, is the goddamn hit detection on some of those big stabs he does. You can get dead angled by this boss where you deflect perfectly, but you get hit anyway because it hits you from behind. On that move just then. A couple of those big enders, if he hits you with those, there's not really much you can do. It's, it's unfortunate. You have to have better positioning. But his first life bar goes down pretty quick. He's going to run away from me now. I like to chase him down with the grappling hook. I like to hit once and then watch what he does. And then after his move, I, I deflect it, and then I get maybe one attacking, depending on what he did. This is a weird one. This has got an awkward timing. Three hits to that, and it's kind of awkward to see. Right now, I don't really want to chase him, because I don't like the position. This is a weird one, too. The final hit in that is one that you, you rarely see that often, and then a rare perilous attack from this boss, too. But close the distance, get one hour one. Here's his swing. It completely misses me because of just craziness. Here's his weird spinny combo into his big overhead. There's the parry. Couple of hits on him. There's the really fast one. Then he's going to run away, doing his cleaves. All of this time you can be using firecrackers. Then he does this on me. And I actually finish him off with that, but I didn't realize. Grapple would have been cool. There can be only one. And there you go. Gayobu Masakati Oniwa is down. And he has a absolutely brutal execution on him. That might be my favourite one in the game, that, because he's just stabbing this poor guy. And the irony of that sentence just then, because we're playing as Ginichiro, so he's asking for our forgiveness as we kill him, which is a little bit dark. But there you go. The first boss is down, it gives you a nice thousand skill points, which is enough to give you, what is that, two extra bars just then? And as long as your game doesn't softlock, you should be able to continue from here, which is nice. Sculptor's Idol's found, and what we're going to do now, ladies and gentlemen, is we're going to be moving through this next area, we're going to be killing a rat, and then we're going to be going to talk to the Tengu. Talking to the Tengu is going to unlock a skill tree that's going to give us access to a move called Uchimanji Inji Minji, which is the best move in the game. And you want to get the double version of it, because it's a very powerful move that enables you to pacify a lot of awkward encounters. It is one of the best moves for building posture against an enemy when you get one opening to attack, and I recommend it highly. It is, of course, the Ichimonji double. 
the second move that we're going to be stressing here is the Senpu Kicks. This is not going to be as effective for some of you guys if you're watching this walkthrough late because the upcoming patch is going to change them to be nowhere near as effective as they are in my videos. However, it must be said guys, the kick itself is still a good counter as opposed to jumping because the jumping posture damage when you do the jump kick that's built into your character, it's just completely underwhelming. But you have to talk to the Tengu twice to get the get the reward. There was an edit there of me dumping in me coming back because I forgot to talk to him a second time. Thought the rat description was him giving me the ability. He didn't give it me and uh, I ended up having to come back. But to save you the time, I've edited that in there and then I can show you how to gain access to another prayer bead. You might be noticing that I have a decent amount of prayer beads and I'm not using them. I will be beating this game with base HP and base posture. Uh, it's not to say that I'm very good at the game or to wave my big dick or anything. It's just because um, I don't need them in what I'm trying to do with this run, which is to show you that the game can be defeated in some pretty, you know, dominant ways, and hopefully I can impart the knowledge that I've learnt playing it. Because if you saw my blind playthrough, which I hope you did, you will notice that the way I played the game originally was vastly different to the way that I'm playing in this walkthrough. And it's a testament to learning the systems and learning how the game wants you to play it. It's also a nice barometer of improvement because there are people who will watch my blind playthrough get very frustrated not understand why I'm not playing very well why I'm not doing what they want me to do why I'm not doing this that and the other whereas I'm hoping if you come to this walkthrough and you watch it if you give it another chance you will see perhaps what you were looking for to begin with but this merchant sells a god seed he's got a couple of the coin purses which are a, a good idea if you die a lot the coin purses are essentially a good way of banking money so that you don't lose it. And in a game like Sekiro, you can die so very quickly, it's probably a good idea to do so. Additionally, on top of that, there are a couple of other things you can buy from him if you want to. You don't have to. If there's any items that I'll be using, um, I will hopefully be able to tell you where they can be farmed or where they can be bought. Like, for instance, using the Divine Confetti... I would never recommend using Divine Confetti until you can buy it from the merchant. When you buy it, it's 300 cent a pop and you can you can get a lot of it by farming. That's the best time to use that. I would recommend using Divine Confetti in almost every fight if you can, and of course using Akko Sugar as well, because those two things together are going to just make the fights quicker, they're going to make the bosses go down faster, and they're just going to give you an easier time. The particle effects also look really nice, so it's one of the great advantages to using them. My problem is I just get sick of buffing. You know, if I have to repeat something a few times or if I'm doing some kind of uh, challenge run, having to do the buffs and wait for the buffs to happen, I just get to the point where I just get so tired of doing it that I don't use them. I haven't really got to that point in, in Sekiro yet because I haven't really buffed too much, but if I had easy access to all of these abilities, you bet your ass I would. But coming up is a boss that I really don't like. It is the Blazing Bull. And the only reason I don't like him is because when you deflect him perfectly on his horns, it does damage to you. It's unavoidable elemental damage. And the best way to hurt this boss is to hit it in the face. But when you stand near its face, it does all kinds of moves that can be a big old pain in the ass. So the strategy I'm going to be showcasing here is going to be a strategy that involves baiting one move where he thrusts towards you and then he pivots at the end of a turn and then as he's turning I'm gonna try and chase his bum hole and hit him with the sword and you would think that this bull would have some kind of backwards kick to get you off the back of him but he never seems to do it I don't know if he even has it but I feel like he's, he's surprisingly co cooperative and if you're behind him like this and moving away from him if he does that hooking like turning blow it will not touch you but if you're too close to the side of his flanks, it will hit. And you'll notice when you don't hit this boss's head, you do no damage at all. You do the epitome of no damage. It's really, really tedious. And if you stand in front of him and you're willing to take the chip damage, you can just keep deflecting his charge and you'll stun him really quickly. Additionally, there's a quick kill on this character, but I don't know how to do it. On the other bull, you can use a firecracker to scare him and he'll knock himself out but this guy I just I just don't understand the setup and because I was trying to uh, take this guy on without taking damage I didn't want to do the trading with the the deflection so instead this is going to probably be the longest fight in the game just purely because look at the damage 
It's so weird. He has one bar of health, but they've made him super tanky unless you hit him on his big old dumb face. And one of the things that you'll notice with this character too is he has so many ways of going into different moves. And somebody in my stream was saying that people have looked into this guy's AI programming, you know, his behavior. And apparently he has like 700 permutations of how he can move into different moves. He's got like tons of programming that governs his animations so that they all flow into each other. So if you ever see this thing doing something weird and you don't really recognize it and you've never seen it before, it's because you probably haven't because he's got so many different permutations of what he can do. And what you'll notice is once you start really whooping his ass and start really killing him, he doesn't give you the move you want. And you can be more aggressive with this strategy that I'm doing. You'll notice that when he runs away after I've punished him, I could be chasing him down and getting another opportunity. But I just kind of wanted to show a defensive slower strat here that does work because all you have to do is wait for one move, run in, get some slashes, and then make sure you're behind him and you're safe. Like, this is probably an, an encounter I should have used um, the the sugar for, the Akko sugar. Maybe even everybody's favourite Divine Confetti, even though I think the Divine Confetti only does more damage through the block and more damage to spirits, so against this particular fellow it probably wouldn't have done much. But doesn't having that big old purple sword look sick? I do, I am a big fan of it. But like, look at that. It's a really fair hitbox. And in a game where there's only so many hitboxes that I would call bullshit, I do think it's quite elegant, that one. And I found a... <laughs> found a really bizarre hitbox the other day. You know the drunkard that's in the Hirata estate? When he does his posture, when he, like, widens his stance so he can do the moving forward palm strikes, he, he raises his right foot and, like, stamps it down. It's nowhere near you. It's to the side of him. It's like an innocuous stance change. But it hurts you. And I don't know why. One of those really bizarre things. Like, some of the, the hitboxes in this game are beautiful. They're, they're as good as it gets in any game I've ever played. And then, I'm nowhere near his right-hand side, that fat bugger, and he stamps his foot and I take damage? The fuck is he playing at? So crazy. But yeah, there's literally nothing to say here. Only that the next bull you face is going to be immeasurably quicker than this, just because of what you can do to him. And I've actually seen the speedrunners kill this bull with the same technique, but it involves using a glitch. And I, and I didn't want to use glitches in this run because I feel like it goes against the spirit of trying to help a new player. I mean, don't get me wrong, if you want a glitch, feel free to do it, but... I'm not going to be the one that advocates it in this walkthrough because it's just not what I believe in. So instead, we, we have the longest fight in human history against the bull. But they've rebalanced the economy of emblems, which I'm interested to see what they'll do with that to make certain things more viable. Because making the skills use emblems, I think, was one of the more questionable design choices in this game. Because they were using it to balance an item that wasn't inherently unbalanced to begin with. Like, I feel like doing the Mortal Blade draw is a really, really good technique that should be rewarded for getting that weapon right. Spamming it is just one of those things that people are going to do when they realize that it does good damage. Whereas, you can spam firecrackers and do way more damage than you'll ever do with a Mortal Draw. So it just, it seems like an interesting, we don't want this to be strong, but we ignore this thing that's really strong over here. Like, we're going to touch the Senpu Kicks, but we're not going to touch Ichimonji Double. It just seems kind of, like, short-sighted to me, in many ways. And I'd love to know where the information came from for why they wanted it changing. Because I sometimes feel like developers get linked to videos of somebody doing something getting one of those like perfect fights where they kill something in three hits and break its posture because they did some kind of sick tech and then the dev just looks at it and thinks oh my goodness that's that's not what we wanted it's broken let's kill that move and it might have not even been the move that was good it was the person using it and I sometimes feel like they, they jump to conclusions like that with certain things and you wouldn't think they would would you given From's history of nerfing and patching how long was the Darkwood Grain Ring the menace of all PvP and Dark Souls? It was a menace for a very long time in a lot of people's minds. You know, it was there for a good solid amount of time before they changed it. And... Like, did you know that the Senpu kicks were really, really good at countering sweeps? Because I'm betting there's more people that didn't know that those kicks were good. 
Because when I see people using it when I've looked at videos, a lot of people just mash the button afterwards and do all the follow-up kicks. And the follow-up kicks are garbage, guys, because the enemies can block them, the enemies can deflect them, and the enemies can actually hit you before you finish those combos. Using that full string is dangerous, but punishing a sweep with it is what made it so good. And my argument against the idea of this move being ridiculously too powerful is that it's a really specific punish. It's not useful in any other environment, any other situation. You can't spam it against the normal enemy and get success because it does fuck all. All you're gonna do is get hit. Like, it's such a strange thing. And I'm still gonna use it because I, li I really like the kick. But there are some pitfalls when you use it that you need to be aware of. And it's the same pitfalls with the Nightjar. Because if you've not tried to use the Nightjar to punish sweeps, the first thing you probably noticed is it misses a lot. The Nightjar attack to punish sweeps is terrible, dude. Absolutely terrible. The only way to make it even remotely useful and actually functional is if you jump and do it in midair. Using skills in midair can sometimes be the only way to make them viable. But that Nightjar move, the whole point of it is like moving forward to punish a sweep, right? It misses all the time, and then when you do land it, it doesn't do that good counter damage either. It's probably the same amount of damage that jumping on an enemy does doing the jump kick. So when you use it, it just doesn't feel like they're rewarding your ability to see the move and punish it. Whereas the Senpu kick, as long as you land the Senpu kick in the frames of the punish, and you don't hit them going up, because it has spinning moves that seem to hit them and neutralize the effect, if you hit them right, you do incredible damage. But I think that's how it should have been, you know? I really do. And even if they do tweak it into the ground, it's still going to be worth using because the utility of that move is way better than the jump. It hits them, it puts them in a big old stunned animation. There's only one criticism for me when I use that, is that I can't seem to cancel the next few hits so that I can attack with my sword. Because if you could come down after the kicks and block cancel, or go into a skill or anything, like use a prosthetic to cancel your recovery, you could then go into some R1s and you could put some serious pain on an opponent. But as it stands, if you press attack after you come down after that, you'll do the kicks and you don't want to do that. Like, I want to use the fucking sword. The, the kicks are slow, there's too much spinning, I want the sword, please. But we're moving into the abandoned dungeon area. We're taking out a couple of guys patrolling. These are the upgraded ones, these will deflect you. And the thing to know with Sekiro is the fundamental truth of this game. When you get deflected, you are at disadvantage. If an enemy deflects you and it makes that distinct clang and it has that gold spark effect, they are in frame advantage, you are in frame disadvantage. If you persist to try and out attack them by just mashing R1, you are going to get beaten every time. There are some instances where you'll still win, where they go to do a slower move, like a perilous move, and you might interrupt it, but if they have any armor in that move, they'll just cut straight through you. And if you're one of those people who likes to wail on people, and then when they hit through your attack, you get really annoyed, it's because you don't understand the principle of super armor. Super armor, hyper armor, armor, whatever you want to call it, it's one of those things that you have to respect. Unless there's a way to break it, you have to respect it. And there's a lot of people that just aren't willing to do that, and that's where they take a lot of damage. Just then, you can't touch the idol while that person is talking, which I think is a bit unfortunate. But we're moving now onto the Senpu Temple and up the Mount Congo region. And I'm doing this a little bit early for some people. The reason I'm doing it is because I want those kicks. And to get those kicks, I have to traverse the full mountain, pretty much. But the people you'll fight here, which are the Shaolin monks that you've seen me fighting right now, or the Senpu monks, I should say, these guys are pretty fair. They've got some nice moves, they've got some good telegraphs, they've got some big sweeps, they've got some multi-hitters. They're kind of a decent assortment of enemies, but there's quite a lot of them coming up in the next en environment. So all I'm going to do is, I'm going to kill the first few guys, and then I'm going to run past the rest of them. So I get a nice bit of combination of a bit of fighting and then a bit of intelligent traversal. Because this forest is dense. This is the quintessential From Software forest of we didn't really have a good idea of how to gracefully dot around enemies, so we just flicked paint at them and every blob of paint that landed on the canvas became an enemy. And that's what you have outside. And then moving through here you have the locusts and then you have evidence of one of the undying monks. But we're going to hook over to this tree, then from here we're going to hook over to this, to the building, 
and then we're going to jump towards the bridge to my left, and then we're going to be hooking towards the next shrine. On this bridge, there is a particularly nasty Twin Blade user. Be very careful of him. He is the destroyer of worlds when he wants to be. Other times, he's really stupid and does nothing but block, and then you just break his posture and kill him. He's one of those weird ones. He'll either murder you instantly, or win an award for being an imbecile. Right now, we have... What was that? Two attack power. Our attack power is a little bit low. But in this game, don't sweat attack power too much. Don't even sweat HP too much, because one of the things you'll notice quite quickly is that even when you have a big bar, there are enemies that are going to hit you for a certain amount of damage regardless of the length of your bar. The bar will help, objectively. There's no arguing that. But there are still times when you can get killed in three hits. Three hits might not sound like a lot to you, and it isn't in a lot of games, but in Sekiro, three hits can be quite a lot, especially with how meticulous some of the attack animations are. And the same with the strength. Upgrading strength in this game is a good idea, but it doesn't really make all that much of a difference outside of a few factors. You're never going to hit the kind of chunks on a boss that you want to hit on their HP, because the game isn't designed that way. The game is scaled to such an extent that you will almost always do a relative amount of damage to bosses, so much so that you'll probably never kill them by attacking them. There are a few enemies where this isn't the case, mostly animals. The Guardian Ape, the Demon of Hatred, you know, things of that nature. These bosses, when you attack them, you do a very respectable amount of damage. Same with uh, the Horseman we killed earlier. Uh, whereas this guy, it doesn't matter what you do to this guy because this, this is a gimmick fight. This is a gimmick fight that I get excited with and end up doing wrong. <laughs> but here comes his flurry. Is he going to do it? He didn't do it. That is really interesting. The ability to fake out his flurry. I don't know if I'd seen that before I did this particular video. And then I missed my Makiri counter because I have to recover. But the idea here, guys, is this guy has the most awkward, baity, completely trolley swings in the history of swings where they start slow, they end fast, they've got like 40 minutes of start up and you want to deflect everything you can because when you break his posture you need to death blow him next to the edge, facing the edge so that you can knock him off. I didn't do it, I got excited. And I say I got excited, that's not even true. I didn't think I was going to break his posture then, I thought he had another hit in him. So uh, I was pressing the buttons quite, quite feverishly. But this is one, two, three and then a final hit. If you do all of that, you'll knock him behind, you'll be able to hit him in the bum hole. And then if you're in the edge like this, when you parry him again, he should go off. But he is the, the mantra that From have adopted since the beginning. In Demon Souls and Dark Souls, the bosses were quite straightforward. The bosses were quite, quite honourable in, in the way that they attacked you. They were simple. They weren't bad, and I'm not saying that as a negative but they were very rudimentary. You saw a swing coming, it moved at a certain speed, you dodged it appropriately. And what happened is that people got really good at that. People got so good at that that From wanted to subvert expectations again. And the way that they did this was by making your expectations betray you in the grand scheme of the fight. So they would make enemies that would intentionally do a really fast animation looking like they're going to attack and then they wouldn't, it'd be a feint, it'd be a fake out into a much slower attack. So they would do this thing that became known as roll catching, which is probably something that came from fighting games. And a lot of moves are designed to scare you into dodging and then hitting you as you come out of the invincibility of your dodge. And then when this became the established norm, it got worse and worse and worse and more complicated and more complex and more nuanced. And now, when we get to Sekiro, you have an enemy like him, where he will literally telegraph a swing doing every face of the clock before he actually swings the blade. And the entire time, you're anticipating a swing that's not happening. And it's, it's good because it's interesting and it's different and it catches everybody out because it's betraying reflex and, and muscle memory of previous established rules and paradigms. Whereas in these later games by From, they're going against that culture of expected timings and throwing some kind of curveball at you. Once you understand that Armored Knight's curveballs, you will stop getting hit by them. And it's the same thing with a lot of the bosses in this game. 
you might be watching this and, and seeing some of these fights and thinking, how the hell are you making this look so easy? How the hell are you deflecting this and doing that and doing these things? It's just because I've looked at the boss a decent amount of time. That's literally it. I've stood in front of them and I've learned the, the feeling of when I'm supposed to press that left bumper. And once you do that, you can trivialize a lot of the game. And one of my criticisms of Sekiro as a whole, and one of the reasons why I think the longevity in this game is going to be heavily hampered in ways that none of the other games that it's been compared to have been, is that once you learn the timing on these bosses for these parries, there's really not much else you can do. And you can argue it's the same in the Souls games, because once you learn the dodge timings and what have you, you can kind of dodge them on muscle and, uh, and on reflex. But I would argue that the bosses in, like for instance, Dark Souls 3, Bloodborne. The bosses in those games are more intricate than the bosses in this game. That was a nice transition, wasn't it? So it's one of those things where there's more nuance to those because there's not only is there more ways to fight them, but they also seem to have more complexity and more tools than a lot of the bosses in this game do. Like, I feel like they're weighing very heavily in Sekiro on your expectations, more so than what's in the game. And when you make it so your entire game is about parrying and deflecting, and that's kind of the the whole mantra of the thing, it can feel like once you do that and once you understand that, that there's not really much else to learn. And I'm hoping that that is proven wrong. I'm hoping that my opinion on that changes over time. And I'm curious if this is going to get DLC because we all know from like to really try to, to just shit in your mouth and make you eat it when it comes to their DLC and its difficulty. But now that we've got the Senpu kicks from the temple, that's what that chest was before we transitioned over here, we're now going to be moving through Ashina to get into the castle. And this is probably one of my least favourite parts of the game. There is an enemy on this rooftop known as the Nightjar. They are a winged Tengu-like creature. He's robed in feathers, he's covered in wrappings, he's got all kinds of scythes and chakrams and throwing knives. And if you if you rock into this one, he's not so bad. He does normal attacks, he spins his blade a bit, he does what he wants. It's the other guy that's the problem. The other guy who throws things is the archer nightjar equivalent. If he starts throwing stuff at you, the stuff he can do with those bloody projectiles is nigh David Copperfield tier. It just, it'll hit you around corners, it'll hit you on roofs, it'll hit you before you've known he's throwing them at you. It, it's just magic, and he's got a million of them to throw because he's been collecting them his entire adult life and it leads to some really awkward situations so I'm gonna take this quite slowly quite stealthily I'm gonna move across the roof in quite a safe path and uh, I had a bit of a strategy that I wanted to test here and it doesn't work but it still works so I don't know what that says about the strategy I don't know what that says about life I don't know what that is on a philosophical level but I know that I'm going to use a Gatchin Sugar right now because I want to have a little bit of uh, ambiguity as I go around this corner. Because this next roof to get to has two guys staring at you. And because you can only grapple to roofs that have those uh, conveniently placed like swirly bits on them, that you can only seemingly get on this roof in a direction where they're looking at you. And I haven't watched if there's a better route. I haven't checked the speedruns or anything. There might be. And if so, I'll probably start using that in future. But at this moment, what I wanted to do is I wanted to drop down onto this ledge and I wanted to just shimmy away from these fellas. But they showed a little bit too much interest and you can see him throwing the bullshit at me. You see this? Just throwing an infinite amount of these curvy bollocks. So I'm in a bit of a bind and I'm, I'm kind of like, well, I've messed this up. But then one of them comes towards me and he's still got the yellow icon above his head and that means I can kill him. And when you're doing the death blow animations, you're invincible. So right now, I can't be hurt. So I do that, hoping that he will pacify, but he doesn't. And then he starts lingering in front of me, trying to hit me with more projectiles. And I make the the rather forward decision to beat him up. So I go up, I start swinging on him. He blocks them badly, he gets killed. And then now, after I've done that, I know that I can get to where I need to be. And it was, it actually turned out to be quite successful. But... Yeah, it wasn't what was intended. Just be very careful coming up. There is the, the Wu Kite guys. The Wu Tang Clan men. And he's coming. And if he touches you, you're dead. Uh, I don't know what it's like when you upgrade your life a ton, but he hurts a ridiculous amount. And then there's another one coming around this corner. You're going to hear it again. Hear the whistle? That means he's coming. So if you grapple into this window, he should not touch you. And then you can hit the shrine. And then from here, uh, we're probably going to go somewhere else. Because I don't do this section of the game just yet. 
And there we go. We walk back to Ashina Castle, and we're going to be taking on the mini boss who's waiting in front of the the gate. So there are four marksmen with this boss. You can kill the marksmen guys with your shurikens, but you need to be careful. If you throw two shurikens too quickly, he will do an alternate toss, and the alternate toss will hit the roof. So the first one is the backhand, the second one is an underhand. The underhand is the one that will end up wasting your emblems. So that was it, see it then? Do not throw too quickly or you'll throw the wrong thing. So my advice would be throw once and then maybe dash and then throw again to make sure you never throw the wrong thing. And I'm doing this because uh, it's the only real way at the moment to pacify these enemies before I fight their friend. And you can stealth attack their buddy and start the fight with him only having one of the the bars, which is what I'm going to do on this particular encounter, because you've seen me fight this guy with the sword a few times, so there's no real need for me to fight him in an honourable manner. Most of the encounters after this against mini-bosses like this guy, I will not be- watch this by the way. Oh hoo hoo! You gotta love it when that happens, right? It doesn't always work like that, but when it does, I'll take it. But for most of the other encounters against opponents where you can get a stealth attack, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to fight them as, as nature intended, as you could say. The corrupted, the true corrupted monk, I'm not decided on yet. I might do a bit of both because I need to show people that you can skip those first two phases, but then I might fight it normally just so that people can get an idea of what it looks like. But there's some divine grass. Over here, I'm going to go and find the merchant, but I make a mistake. I jump on this wall and I trigger a Tengu and the... And the uh, the Nightjar starts throwing dog shit at me. It couldn't have been a Nightjar who had a stick, could it? Couldn't have been the Scythe guy who, who generally doesn't do that. He comes towards you. It's the one guy throwing random projectiles at me. But I come down here to this fellow. Once you talk to him, he's going to go back to the dilapidated temple. And then I'm going to have to use the, the Buddha carving to get out of dodge because I don't want to risk this environment with him throwing shit at me. It's just unnecessary. So we're going to bounce out. Back to the last communed idol. And then we'll go from there. Back to the uh, Ashina castle. And then from here... Uh, I don't know what I do. Am I going to open up the Ashina reservoir? Potentially, right? Yeah, I'm going down there. So there's... There's an idol down here. And there's a couple of interesting things in this environment. One of them is a spear that you can get for your prosthetic. One of them is a, a mini boss against an assassin. And then the other one is a mini-boss against a guy called the Seven Spears of Ashina. And the Seven Spears of Ashina is one of those mini-bosses that people think is one of the hardest in the game for very good reason. He has a terrible environment where you're always fighting him on a hill. There's a million dudes being dickheads stopping you from fighting him. And then he's just really tricky because he's got lots of twirls, lots of elaborate animations. He's got two life bars. You can stealth assassinate one of them if you want to. You can do all kinds of shenanigans with him if you want to, but fighting him head up is definitely a, an arduous task. And I loved this camera angle, but it didn't work, so it wouldn't let me pick it up, which was unfortunate. I wanted to do, like, the Legend of Zelda mode, and uh, and I got cock-blocked. So thank you, FromSoft, thank you for that. But yeah, coming over here, you can talk to this guy if you want to. What I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to show you the position where you can stealth attack him from, which is from this cliff. And then it's going to transition from here to me downstairs with him and then starting the fight. And it's very important that you learn this enemy because you're going to fight tons of them. And the problem you're noticing immediately with this environment is you can't see a damn thing. It's so difficult to see. But the general premise of this character is he has a couple of these kick moves. This move here is usually followed by a sweep if you parry it. And the sweep can be punished with the Senpu Kick. This is a multi-hitting move that has a double hit, and then the Makiri counter at the end. Getting the timing of that move is a bit tricky, but once you do, it's a really good opening. Here's the kick that you deflect, and then you use the Senpu. And there you go, that's the end of the fight. Did you see the damage that did to his posture? Did you notice how I knew the kick was coming, I punished it perfectly, and I got rewarded? Well, that doesn't happen anymore, apparently. They've removed that. They've removed the rewarding punish for that move. Which is really disappointing, but what can you do? Hopefully it's still okay. Hopefully they didn't completely destroy it. Because let's bear in mind, guys, they nerfed the Fume Greatsword, and that thing still did incredible damage. It wasn't one-shotting invaders from full HP, but it was still pretty bollocks, wasn't it? And then now, 
Am I going to go for him? I might, you know. This might have him in the video. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? Which will be interesting because I don't do it in the in the video. Because I think I'm going to trim it out. But I get to the seven spear guy. He ends up killing me as he inevitably does. And then I clear the entire environment out. And then I fight him on his own. And then I win. But I didn't leave in the footage of me clearing the entire environment out because it was boring. So I don't know if that's going to be in this one. But you get a little inside view behind the scenes of how these runs work. There's a lot of editing in this, guys. I don't do every single fight in the game perfectly on my first attempt. That's not the kind of player that I am. Double check I've got the kicks on. Yeah, I think we're going to fight him. Which is sweet because this is a cool fight. But you're going to see a transition coming up. This is a path to him without fighting all the guys over there. But you'll notice there's going to be a crossfade. So... I could have stealth attacked him if I wanted to. I didn't want to. I wanted to give him a fight. And then this is the one. So whenever you Makiri counter this man, he has two potential counters to you that you have to be cognizant of. This move here has multiple hits to it if he chooses to do it. He didn't then for some reason. This twirl, you can actually hit him twice if you react to it quick enough. And then I just kind of wait. Personally, I don't like countering this guy with Makiri. I prefer to dodge than to to get that specific counter and this one I do it too because you generally usually get the counter afterwards but just then I interrupted his attempt because I just prefer it there's the second hit couple swings on him there's the first of his HP bars going down keep the pressure on him see what he does back us up into a thrust get away from it hit him from behind big spin again one hit into thrust does he counter it yes he does i was tempted to swap go into the menu and swap to the the uchi, uchi minji manji double but what happens is when you're fighting you can't pause sometimes so it makes it really difficult to get in your menu when you need to because if it was up to me i'd be swapping between skills all the time and then i just edit out the menu so it looks like i'm using all these cool moves and it make the fights really sexy but unfortunately, because you can heal and stuff in the menus, they cock block you from accessing them at certain points. But thank you for watching, guys. Welcome to the walkthrough. I hope it helps, or at least you learn something that you didn't know. And if you don't, I hope you at least enjoy watching Genichiro get some vengeance, because they certainly threw him under the bus in this game, didn't they? You take care now.